first of a two-part series in on retrofitting to net zero, which is a possibility. You can take an existing house and make changes to it so that you can actually um, create a net zero situation with that house. And part one is knowing the landscape. So we're gonna do some background here. So first of all, a few things about Enviro Center. This is a, the, the building in the background is actually our offices on uh, Somerset Street. And um, so we've been in, uh, going for about 20 years here in, in Ottawa. We are your friendly neighborhood, local environmental nonprofit. Our mission is to provide people, communities, and organizations in Ottawa with practical solutions to lighten their environmental impact in lasting ways. And our work focuses on four main areas, that is green homes, active transportation, green lifestyles, and green business. So we would uh, be falling into green homes in this situation. Let's talk about Carbon 613. Uh, we actually have this program for businesses. Um, it's a membership-based program that uh, allows people to set their targets and uh, and do some carbon accounting. Uh, but through Carbon 613, you can get access to events, resources, discounts. We have these tools for carbon analysis and target setting. And it's a local network of businesses, kind of a club of businesses uh, committed to climate action. Obviously, our... Uh, our social activities are a, little, are a little curtailed at the moment. I just want to talk about energy services, which is the Department of Enviro Center that deals with this kind of thing. Um, that is home and MERB energy audits. We also do business energy analysis and audits and business carbon accounting through Carbon 613. And then on a, on a broader perspective, um, green audits uh, of, of various kinds. I am Greg Furlong, uh, Senior Energy Analyst is my title here. I, I've been doing this kind of stuff for quite a few years. I'm an energy advisor with Enercan. I'm licensed or qualified to deliver net the CHBA net zero label labeling program. Also Energy Star and R2000. I'm also a certified energy manager. I've done, I've evaluated more than 700 private homes since 2003 and over a hundred multi-unit residential buildings, plus about a dozen commercial audits. And uh, from the business perspective, because this is a, a series that's is kind of focused on people who are business owners, uh, I was co-founder of a successful retail business in Toronto and, uh, and ran that business, I was involved in running that business from a day-to-day -day perspective for about four years. And that business actually continues to this day. Our goals today, uh, to do some background in Net Zero, to compare the rating systems, uh, various other rating systems that are out there, and to look at some easy retrofits. So first of all, um, starting the process. What is net zero? There's a picture there of a, of a house that could very well be net zero given the amount of solar panels there is on a roof and on the garage. So um, in this illustration also, you, this is one of the features of net zero homes. You don't just see a few panels up there. There's gonna be a whole roof full of them. And uh, the basic equation is your, year, your yearly household energy is going to equal your yearly energy generated on site. And uh, in this house, you can see a, a number of the features. Um, the double insulation would be characteristic of a new build. Um, the heat pump would be very characteristic. There's a heat pump water heater there. We'll be talking about all these things as we go along through the, through the presentation. Exceptional air sealing. So let's look at the net zero retrofit savings, just to show kind of where you're gonna land in terms of energy use. So this would be 
an existing house that was retrofitted. And um, if you look at the, at the chart at the top, it gives you the, the totals in gigajoules per year, where that, this house started out at 105 gigajoules per year, and then through retrofits was brought down to 34 gigajoules per year, which is pretty low. And um, these are the bars that show how that was done. It was basically the heating requirements were drastically reduced and the domestic hot water also drastically reduced. And then the lighting and appliance energy was slightly reduced as well. Um, on top of the, uh, and finally the, um, the energy used for air conditioning was reduced. So we have lower energy consumption, which is 65 to 100% lower. And, um, and you reach the 100% by, by offsetting it with um, electrical production. The electricity generation offsets your consumption. And you do get drastic carbon reductions as well of up to 95%, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Here's a net zero example. Uh, this is an energy retrofit at a 1980s row house as follows. So a mid-efficiency gas furnace was upgraded to an air source heat pump with electric furnace. Standard domestic hot water was upgraded to a heat pump water heater with drain water heat recovery. Air leakage was reduced from 4.6 down to 1.5 ACH50. Lighting and appliance upgrades were applied. And all windows were, were replaced with triple pane fiberglass. And um, so on the left, you can see what the differences were. If you're starting at 100%, the green bars represent where you landed after all, the, all these upgrades. So we have uh, big uh, energy reductions of 63%. We have CO2 going down by 94%. And our costs go down by 30%. So not only are these um, energy and, and CO2 reductions, but they're actually substantial ongoing cost reductions. And then finally, 500 square feet of solar panels were installed to match the reduced usage. So in this chart at the bottom, you can see what happens between net zero ready and net zero. We now knock our energy use down to zero because that remaining 37% is now being uh, offset on an annual basis with the photovoltaic cells. Our CO2 is reduced a little bit more and our costs go down dramatically because we've now uh, reduced what was formerly just our electric bill um, in, the, in, the, in the net zero ready situation. We've reduced that, uh, we've actually offset our entire electricity consumption. And so the 15% the that remains is actually just the, the fixed costs that are associated with our electric bill, just to keep that electric account open. So this is the kind of scenario that you would expect to see. This is the way you would expect to see it play out in, these, in this kind of situation when you're going to net zero ready or net zero. So moving towards net zero, how do we get there? So uh, a drastically reduced lower heating and cooling demand. So our furnace doesn't have to work as hard. Ultra efficient heating. So the heating system that we put in uses much less energy and electricity generation on site. Those are the basic steps. So looking at the lower heating and cooling demand. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to put in plenty of insulation. Uh, you're going to have very low air leakage in the house and that target is is quite low um, compared to uh, other, compared to normal building standards, which would be around three ACH 50 these days. And advanced windows. There's a window from uh, an energy star label from a window that's basically um, in a, and on a, on a, in a nutshell what you're going to need to do. You will also need to provide ventilation because at 1.5 ACH at 50 pascals or air changes per hour at 50 pascals translates to very low natural ventilation rates. So the answer is to install fresh air machines so-called 
which would be HRV, heat recovery ventilator, or ERV equipment. And there's one such HRV. So as a result, you're gonna have very low heating and cooling needs. Typically, for a 2,000 square foot home, you might only need 36,000 BTUs per hour. And if you look at your standard gas furnaces, you have a hard time getting anything lower than 40,000. So uh, you're looking at pretty small heating systems. You will also probably need cooling. When the ambient temperature is above 26 degrees for extended periods, if there's high interior energy use, because that will pre be heating up the interior of your now well insulated and air sealed home. And if there's a high occupancy load, you know, we're putting off 100 watts per person to, to heat up that space year round. We don't, uh, we, we keep heating up the space in the summer as well as the winter. And if there's excessive solar gain, you're going to need to uh, do something about that uh, when, it, when summertime comes around. So air source heat pumps turn out to be a very good choice for this application. They are the right kind of sizing and they will do both heating and air conditioning. Let's look at some heating upgrades. I just wanted to run through some scenarios with you. If you, and in this case, if, the, if you have an electric water heater, because I wanted to take the, kind of take the, the a gas water heater out of the equation, just so we can look at the only gas consumer in the house being the gas furnace. If you upgrade your, your gas heating efficiency, let's say you had an older furnace and it was only 80% and you went up to 96 AFUE, you get only about a 10% energy reduction and you get about a 15% reduction in your CO2. So these two bars are showing, uh, they're showing the, uh, on the one on the left shows you the energy and actually you can imagine each one of these bars actually starts at 100. So it's going down, the energy is going down 10% and, the, and you can see that one's going down about 15, the, the gray one per carbon. The next scenario, we upgrade the air conditioner to an air source heat pump. And in this case, you get quite a bit more energy savings. You get about 33% energy savings and a 75% drop in your CO2. And in, and in this scenario, we actually kept the original furnace. So the original furnace is still there as a backup. And then finally, if you remove the gas entirely and you, re and you replace uh, it with a heat pump with an electric furnace, then you're gonna, you're gonna get further energy savings and about 90% CO2 reductions. So uh, you can see how this, would, this would play out over time. So this, uh, the point here is that you could, if you're going to do it in stages, you could start out by putting in your air source heat pump to replace the AC, and it would already have a, a substantial impact and then eventually uh, replace that furnace uh, when it fails with electric backup for the, for the, final, the final strokes. Let's look at electricity generation. So the rooftop area that you have available for, for photovoltaics basically tells you the maximum energy use that you can offset. So about, if you have about 500 square feet of south facing roof, you can, you can get roughly 30, you can offset roughly 35 gigajoules in a year. We have a 10 kilowatt net metering limit here in Ottawa. And that's not an absolute limit, but it means if you go above that, you will have to pay more uh, for regulation and so on. So you'll, you'll see a lot of the systems will tend to be under that limit because uh, you'll, you've got to go up another bump in your, in, in your finances when you cross that limit. But that basically means that you can get up to about 45 gigajoules in in uh, production from your solar panels. And by the way, wind is not generally available in Eastern Ontario. We, um, 
that, and that's why you don't see a lot of windmills in this area. We, we, it doesn't play out well in this area, uh, except for perhaps along the St. Lawrence and in a few isolated pockets. So towards uh, net zero, uh, let's look at the balance. So we already mentioned the maximum production that you could get um, was about 45 gigajoules. That means that your maximum house rating uh, should be around 45 gigajoules on the Energuide rating system scale. So that's where you, you need to be aiming for. That's, that means the house details that need to be modeled in HOT 2000, you have to match that level. So whoever's doing your energy modeling needs to be kind of aiming for that as a maximum. Obviously you can go lower than that, but that's uh, when you're thinking about retrofitting, um, it's good to keep these numbers in mind. Your certified energy advisor, therefore, is gonna be a very important part of the picture. They're gonna create a model based on plans, figure out your energy balance, recommend cost-effective and workable solutions, and perform blower door testing and site inspections. Also, at the end, they're going to be providing the net zero label in some way. We'll look at this, uh, the net zero, this net zero uh, labeling program has been developed by the Canadian Home Builders Association. In this, uh, in this plan, in this, in this process, each net zero and net zero ready home is verified by a third party service organization and recognized by the CHBA for its achievement. So the results are, and this is another picture of the same uh, bar graph that we saw earlier. You have uh, a house that has outstanding comfort, has a tiny carbon footprint, and very low operating costs. So uh, you end up with, a, with a, a great house. I guess the question is, how do you get there? And we'll try to provide you with some answers as we go along here. So considerations, let's look at um, solar gain. So uh, in the past, this, uh, the idea of uh, net zero was coupled also with the idea of a passive solar house where you could essentially, you could essentially have a house that was heated by the sun. Um, this is possible, but it ends up being a very tricky equation to solve. There's a, a lot of uh, complicated things going on and depending on your climate, it might not work out uh, very well. But, you know, solar gain can contribute up to 50% of your heating. Uh, it's just uh, a little bit difficult to manage. If you have too little, your heating system is going to consume more energy. So obviously you want to have some and it is in fact factored in, uh, for example, in HOT 2000, uh, Solar gain is factored in there as, as contributing towards uh, keeping the house warm. If you have too much, you get summertime overheating and then you're gonna have to have more cooling. So that's, uh, that's not so great. So with good solar design, you have strategic window sizing and placement. You have overhangs for summer shading, film treating, film treatment for east and west windows and possibly south, depending on the situation. Um, and landscaping and deciduous trees can help. But it turns out that, it, that super insulation as a strategy is usually better than passive solar. The advantage of super insulation is that you, you basically have a, a house that, that is, in this case, super insulation also refers to having an airtight house that is also very well insulated. And with that house, the, now the window placement is not so crucial. You don't have to worry about, for example, if you're a new builder, new home builder, you don't have to worry so much about how the house is oriented and so on. It ends up being a more flexible way of building houses and is less sensitive to conditions. So 
if for well insulated houses, rather than depending on passive solar coming in through the windows and so on, uh, photovoltaics is a better way to collect solar energy. You can you can store it, you can use it for all kinds of things. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, once you convert it to electricity, it becomes uh, quite useful. So vital equipment, uh, heat exchangers. The, so what they do is um, they transfer heat energy from one flow to another flow. The flows do not touch. And um, they're actually very commonly used uh, in, even in things that you use every day, such as furnaces, boilers, and automobiles. The radiator on your automobile is a, um, essentially a water to air uh, heat exchanger. The hot water is coming out of your engine and the air is flowing through the radiator to cool it. Now, the uh, heat exchanger is the basis of HRV, ERV, and rainwater heat recovery. And in this picture, it's the diamond-shaped element in the middle of the HRV is the heat exchanger at where there's a kind of um, a grid set up inside this, uh, this cube. And it allows the air to flow through in various directions, but without those air flows touching. So they can recapture quite a bit of the energy and up to 75% or even more in, in some uh, models. Um, and uh, transfer that out, the energy from the outgoing air into the incoming air. If you have a drain water heat recovery unit, it does a similar thing with your drain water, with your wastewater going down the stack. Uh, if, it, if that water is warm, it will then heat the water that's coming in uh, on the heat exchange that's wrapped around the stack. And, uh, and, and that will be used to, to, heat, the, uh, to heat your uh, water going into your water heater and, and so on. And so they, they are uh, up to 60% efficient or so at capturing that heat. Heat pumps. Now, these are uh, various, very mysterious pieces of equipment, uh, but essentially the pumping is the idea that they're gonna pump energy from one place to another. And they provide both heating and cooling usually. So when we're looking at air source heat pumps, uh, we've got a CLP, a coefficient of performance of 1.5 to 3.5, which means, um, that for every unit of energy you put in, you get between one and a half to three and a half units out. And they cost uh, uh, around, let's say around 10,000. That's, that's the, um, the absolute cost. And it may be a little bit higher or a little bit lower than that, depending on the, on the situation. The incremental cost between that, uh, between an air source heat pump and an air conditioner though is quite a bit less. It'd be less than $5,000. So uh, also I was gonna say that uh, another way of thinking of COP is uh, multiply by 100 and think of it as percentage. So if you, you have a, an air source heat pump, it's, if your furnace is 96% efficient, that seem, may seem great, but the, your air source heat pump can be 100, is gonna kind of start at 150% to 350% efficient. And the reason being, it's not creating energy, but it's, uh, it's basically taking that energy from somewhere else, in, the, in, in this case, the outdoor air and, uh, and bring it inside to heat your indoor air. So uh, they, they use roughly 50% uh, uh, of the energy of a, of a natural gas furnace and 95% less uh, the CO2 than natural gas. The operating costs are now similar uh, for these, for these uh, units. They, uh, the efficiencies have gone up and um, the, uh, the way the numbers pan out, they end up actually being quite similar in operating costs. And they're now effective in colder climates like Ottawa. So we have colder climate heat pumps that are being built now. Uh, the, when they first came in to this region in the 80s, uh, we were using uh, units that were uh, designed for use in much warmer areas like the Southern US 
and uh, that's why they weren't particularly effective here. You can also have ground or water source heat pumps, and they have even higher COPs, up to 5.5, but the costs are also quite a bit higher because there's uh, excavation and other installation costs. So um, you have to bear that in mind uh, if you're um, if you're looking at these systems. So it's not a they're not a, just a straight switch out as it would be with um, an air conditioner, a central air conditioner, and an air source heat pump. We also have the heat pump water heaters, uh, which heat your water, and they uh, they heat your water by cooling the air inside your house. So, which in the summer is great because you would probably want to have that cooling anyway. Uh, and in the winter, um, you they it just will be an additional uh, an additional heating load on your central heating system. So something a little bit about the about the economics of photovoltaics. Your typical available roof, as we said earlier on, was around 500 square feet, which would get you about 10,000 kilowatt hours per year in Ottawa, and will support about 35 gigajoules of energy consumption per year. Um, right now. The retail cost, uh, the install installed cost for one of these systems is around 20 grand. But if you work out uh, the the savings, uh, it actually amounts to about a seven percent um, annual rate of return on your investment. So it's actually a great investment. These uh, systems come with 25 year warranties now, and uh, and are expected to last up to 30 years. So they're a very uh, long-term investment. So uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, now field any questions, if there are any, any questions at this point. Vita, are there, is there anything, um, any, any incoming questions? Yeah, indeed there are. Um, so somebody is asking, Brian is, ask, Brian is asking, sorry, can you please explain again what COP is? Ah, so it's a coefficient of performance, and it's used to rate um, air source heat pumps. And um, so basically, it, it tells you how much energy you get out of a system as compared to the amount of energy you put in. So it would mean that, uh, let's say you put it, uh, you put in 100 watts, uh, 100 kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours into a, a system, uh, then you would get 150 kilowatt hours out. And um, so uh, it it means what it means is that your your as I said earlier, these systems are not creating. They're not like. Um, they're not like a perpetual motion machine or something like that. That's uh, some kind of fanciful idea. They're actually um, are are taking energy out of the outdoor air in the in the case of air source heat pumps, and they'll cool it more. It may not seem to you like the outdoor air has a lot of energy in it when you walk outside in the winter, but um, that air still can be cooled down quite a bit. Uh, you know, down to minus two seventy. Um, if, if you wanted to. So it actually has still quite a bit of energy left in it. And, uh, and that's what the air source heat pump does. It takes that cold air, but it, it, it cools it down even further. And in doing so, it, it is able to take energy out of it. And it brings that energy inside and reconverts it into heat and uses that to heat your home. So the COP basically is just a measure of the performance of those kinds of systems. And they tend to actually, one thing about those systems is they will tend to vary with the temperature. So the warmer it is outside, the better the COP will be. So let's say um, it's plus five outside, you're still gonna need heating, but the coefficient of performance of your heat pump will now be quite a bit higher. It'll, let's say it'll be around three. As you get into, into colder temperatures, typically a heat pump, its uh, coefficient of performance will drop. And um, but with but now with uh, some of the uh, of the newer heat pumps, they have uh, systems that will compensate for this, and so they can maintain their coefficient of performance down to minus fifteen or minus twenty. So uh, anyway, I hope that answers your question. 
Great, thanks. Um, I think it does. She said, thank you very much. And then we have another question from Christopher that says, how low can the outdoor air temperature be for the new ASHPs? Ah, yes. So um, they will perform well uh, down to minus 15, and which is really all you need for Ottawa. We may be thinking that we're getting minus 40 days outside, but we're, we are factoring in the, the wind chill for most of the time. I checked the weather stats on Ottawa and it has actually gone down below minus 30 uh, only a handful of times in the, in the last 40 years. So, uh, and so we do get down to minus 20, but we only get down to minus 20 typically for a few hours overnight at a time. So we, we don't need to go, we don't need to have a lot of extra reserve uh, below for a system to heat below minus 15. When it goes below minus 15, then it would go to backup. Uh, it, may, it may need to go to a backup system to provide the extra heating, but that would be only for a few hours each winter. So it ends up being only a, a minor factor. So when, earlier on when I was saying that you could keep your gas furnace as a backup, that's what I was referring to, that the gas furnace would come on when the air source heat pump was getting down into an, an area where it couldn't handle the entire heating load. Does that, uh, I hope that uh, answers your question. Okay, there's nothing else. There's been some sharing around examples of cold climate air source heat pumps and something else, which I'm not sure what it is, but I can send you those links after Greg, if you want to. Yeah, talk. you can, if you want to do some research, uh, you can, Mitsubishi, for example, has been one of the leaders in this area, but there are others who are now producing cold climate heat pumps. There's also a site, um, there's also an organization in Vermont that generates a list of, of equipment that it deems uh, worthy of, the, of that term, a cold climate heat pump, that would be appropriate for, uh, for use in, in colder climates. But uh, in truth, most of the heat pumps now produced and, and sold in Canada are, are actually pretty good down to cold temperatures. They, what we have now on the market would have been called a, virtually anything now on the market would have been called a cold climate heat pump uh, 10 years ago. So uh, the market is, is changing all the time. It's getting better and the prices are, are going down, thankfully. Uh, Marianne also mentions that pallet stoves could be a fun and attractive backup if you want to get right off gas. They could be, yes, if you were, yes, but you can, yes, uh, abso uh, absolutely. You can have anything as a backup. The, the drawback with any, anything, um, uh, the, the drawback is that you have to burn things uh, to, to run a, a pellet stove. Uh, so you're gonna have to, to stock that uh, stuff away. And, uh, but yes, absolutely, you could, you could go that route. And, uh, and it, may, um, it may save you uh, some, some kilowatt hours. So we'll, we're going to carry on now uh, just to uh, do some background, uh, some more background and discussion around why net zero. Um, the CHBA ran a survey uh, of, uh, of, their, of clients, of their clients. And um, they, this is for new housing, by the way. And they, uh, they wanted to find out what people were looking for in, when they're looking in, for in a new house. And it turned out that four of the top 10 must-haves are energy related which included uh, energy efficient appliances, high efficiency windows, overall energy efficient home, and uh, HRV or ERV air exchange. So um, what is a little bit disappointing is that the top one was walk-in closets, but, uh, but still uh, I think it's a pretty good showing for people being aware of these uh, energy uh, factors. Uh, here's a chart that we created uh, at Envira Center. Um, now, uh, just is to compare some of these uh, different rating systems. Uh, so, if you look at net zero, it's um, we're looking at 65 to 100 percent better than code. So, 65 would be 
net zero ready. It might be somewhere between, let's say, um, 65, 75, uh, somewhere in there. Um, compared to, uh, and then the 100% would be the, the, the net zero, obviously. Compared to for Energy Star for new homes uh, is about 20% better than code. And, and code is, is that black bar right in the middle. Um, this was, this was uh, put together last year, so that's why it says built 2019. 50% um, better uh, is, uh, is R2000. And um, Passive House is, uh, is also kind of up in the same territory as Net Zero Ready. Uh, actually, there's nothing that says you can't add uh, solar PV to Passive House. Uh, so it's kind of in the same territory as Net Zero Ready, but it, um, it, it has different requirements. Uh, and uh, we won't be looking at that in, in much detail, but uh, we'll maybe discuss them a little bit later on. So uh, what do you get with your uh, Net Zero retrofit? You get um, the operating costs that are the same or lower than an equivalent uh, code-built house. Uh, you get better heat distribution and ventilation than, than that house would be. And you get 65 to 100% less energy use with this huge reduction in greenhouse gases. And um, you know, that is what we are uh, have been talking about uh, more and more is the reduction of, of, uh, of carbon. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, cover that in the slide a little bit later on. So uh, you also get cost neutrality when you consider the life, lifetime operating costs. So you get only about five to 10% added costs. You have a 65% reduction in your energy consumption, your electricity bill, uh, is only the fixed costs, as you can see with um, net zero, uh, because you're covering all your electricity use. When you close your gas account, uh, this is often not fi factored in, but you, even if you don't use any gas at all, you're still paying $285 a year. So when you close that gas account, you're going to save at least $285 a year just by closing the account. When you have a safer home, safer home, you have lower insurance costs. You can check this with your insurance broker, but you will have, uh, if you don't have combustion happening in the, in the house, that means that there's less likelihood of a fire. You also have lower operating costs. So that means a lower risk for mortgage lenders. And, uh, and that is factored in with some uh, lending institutions. Some background on net zero now. So in 2006, Entercan and CMHC had the Equilibrium Sustainable Housing Demonstration Initiative. And they launched this, they put it out there and they had, um, there were uh, builders across the country who responded and, and, and with innovative designs to come up with uh, net zero or near net zero homes. So there were 12 completed houses ultimately, including right here in Ottawa, uh, Minto uh, constructed a home that they called Inspiration. 11 of these homes were monitored for actual energy performance. All of them came in at less than 50 gigajoules per year. And by the way, the, you can think of an average being around, of an, of an average new home with our, uh, all our um, latest energy improvements being around 100 or maybe a little bit more than 100. So that's pretty good. Uh, seven of them were less than 25 gigajoules. So, uh, so that's getting very low. And uh, three of them were less than five gigajoules. So they were effectively net zero because that's, uh, that's getting pretty close to the bar. So that went to 2012. In 2013, Entercan, uh, they launched this R2000 net zero energy pilot that, they, that ran for about three years. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted to mention uh, in the previous slide, this Echo Haven was one of the three uh, homes that actually was effectively net zero. You can see the, the large array of solar panels on the roof there. 
And, uh, and also on the right, you can see a very large uh, array of uh, solar panels. So in this case, 23 net zero energy homes were built by six builders in three provinces. That included, again, Minto, uh, and they built five homes in Canada. Now, four of those five homes are shown in this, in this drawing. At, at the top uh, is the plan view of the front view. So it's kind of uh, flipped around in the bottom where we are looking at the back. And they've strategically lo located the, the solar panels on the roof so that they're, uh, I would assume, not optimally matched uh, to create as much solar power as much uh, as possible. Uh, but then they are also not seen from the road, so uh, it's kind of invisible. Uh, I guess they didn't see it as a as a, a visual selling point for the homes. So all of the houses were certified R2000 and were labeled with a zero gigajoule rating under the ERS version 15. And another thing is, as opposed to the, to the previous uh, one, um, these technologies were limited to pre-engineered products and systems. So they had to have basically stuff that you could, you could buy uh, off the shelf. Also note with the, uh, in the photograph at the, at the bottom, you can see the heat pumps in the backyards. You'll see, you'll notice the end units have, uh, have larger, have heat pumps that appear to be double the size of the ones in the middle. Those are those little white, uh, white looking boxes at the left of each home. Um, and that's probably because the end units uh, have a slightly higher heating demand because they have more exposed surface. They have the end walls to also keep, uh, to that are losing, uh, they're losing heat through their end walls. Canadian Home Builders Association. So from 2015 to 2016, they ran a net zero pilot phase. And in 2017, they launched the CHBA home labeling program. And uh, here's a, a sample of their uh, net zero ready home label. So they, uh, so you can get uh, a label for either of these categories, net zero and net zero ready. It is performance based, which means that it's uh, each home is individually rated. There are currently 33, well, more than 33 builders in seven provinces that are involved in this program. Just to give you an idea of the growth, in Ontario, there were th only three labels in 2017. There were 43 in 2018. Now, uh, across Canada, there's more than 265 that have been rated. Now, the CHBA is expanding to also include ratings for a, a different rating system for renovated homes and mid-rise multi-unit residential buildings. In 2019, and this is another uh, step in this direction, um, the Federation of uh, Canadian Municipalities, almost forgot my acronym there, uh, had uh, this feasibility study done uh, to look at uh, tools uh, to, to promote net zero energy development. So um, there were 40 cities surveyed uh, and eight sites evaluated. They worked out some design and technology strategies and, and they proposed incentives for the, for, uh, to, to uh, go in that direction. Now, uh, for some global perspectives on net zero, because, uh, and, and this, this icon on the right is uh, something that, that has been put out by the federal government. And as you can guess, um, they're looking to be uh, ready to reach net zero. Um, we're not exactly sure what that means yet, uh, but uh, net zero ready by uh, 2030. So there, there has been widespread research on net zero in many countries. The US has apparently built more than 5,000 homes since 2013 that are net zero. In California, um, uh, as of 2020, um, and this is a step in this direction. Uh, all new homes must have at least two kilowatts of PV installed. And uh, I guess in California, that might actually be adequate to offset your energy use. The city of Copenhagen is um, 
is has as, as a, a target to to reach net zero greenhouse gases by 2025. They've already uh, done 44% reductions since 2005, so they're well on their way. In Canada, we're hoping to get 30% 30, 30 below 2005 levels by 2030 and to reach um, uh, net zero GHGs by 2015. And, and here are some other countries that are also involved in this kind of target setting. Denmark, Norway, and the UK, and others are, are jumping on board. So um, this would be part of a global initiative, what, what we're trying to do with net zero uh, with these homes. Now, the bill on to go on to some of the more practical aspects, uh, just to look at who can, uh, how these programs are delivered. Um, first of all, the, it's the builder who is actually the, the main party involved in this situation. So first of all, builders and renovators must be a member of the Canadian Home Builders Association. They have to have at least one staff person successfully complete the net zero building science training. They need to become an EnerGuide registered builder with EnerCan before starting the home. And that's a fairly straightforward uh, part of the process. And um, after the first net zero or net zero ready home is labeled, the builder can actually register. So the first one is kind of a trial period. So that's, uh, here's more on the, on the builder requirements. So there needs to be builder training. Uh, and uh, to support this, the CHBA has developed building science training and also sales training. They've also um, developed an energy advisor training uh, component as well, which obviously builders would be would be welcome to take. Uh, but the the uh, building needs to be actually rated by a third party. Uh, so, but obviously in-house expertise is valuable. Training can be taken through qualified SOs, including Enviro Center and can be delivered by qualified trainers. And uh, this link, uh, when you, uh, if you get a, a hard, uh, not a, a hard copy, but if when you get a copy of the presentation, uh, this link will guide you to uh, the pertinent sites uh, for this information. So getting the timing right, you wanna get your net zero consultation early in the, in the design stage. So you need to have a qualified energy advisor at the ta at the table uh, when you're working out your design because these as these uh, net zero aspects are going to affect the design of the project. From the energy advisor, you're going to get expert insight uh, from the building science perspective. They're going to do energy modeling, which takes in all the effects of each kind of energy use and is your best guide to all the impacts of each upgrade. And bear in mind that ventilation and comfort need to be carefully considered and uh, the energy advisor would be an excellent person to consult with in that aspect. They would also help to decide on ultimately the type of heating system that best fits the energy picture. So if the pellet stove fits, we could install it. The net zero retrofit plan will affect your foundations. It'll affect your walls and windows, your attic and your HVAC systems. The energy advisor is gonna provide feedback on the model defect of change. They can also provide pre-drywall blower door testing and ultimately confirmation that the build meets the technical requirements and is on track to qualify. 
So for the, as far as the net zero label goes, the builder renovator is responsible for complying with the agreement and meeting all program requirements. They are responsible that their homes meet the program technical requirements and they need to provide attestation to CHBA that all program requirements have been met. In this case, what that refers to is that there may be a number of elements that will be hidden within the building that the energy advisor will not be able to inspect. And so the builder needs to uh, provide attestation that, um, that those elements as well do meet the requirements for the program. And the builder also needs to work, uh, renovator needs to work with the um, energy advisor and the service organization to get the, the ERS, the Energuide rating system and the net zero, net zero ready labels for the home. So now we're gonna look at some easy energy efficiency upgrades. So if you're starting with poorly insulated ceilings, that's uh, obviously a great place to start. Uh, you would want to, in this case, maximize them. Um, you could reduce your heating by about 10%. In rare cases, it may be more than that if you're starting from uninsulated, let's say in a bungalow. Um, so first of all, you, with attics, you would want to air seal them first based on uh, blower or IR testing, that's infrared uh, testing. Uh, actually, the, the infrared testing is coupled with the blower uh, testing. And uh, you would also want to uh, insulate, uh, and I would recommend blown cellulose for most situations where it's very economical, but actually also highly effective. If you have a flat roof or a cathedral ceiling, there will be a custom approach required based on the particular situation. As added benefits to the home, there will be reduced leaks, smaller icicles, and lower maintenance costs to your roof. Uh, this is um, a picture of a commercial door actually uh, under air leakage, that uh, test that we performed. And just to show you when the house, when the building was depressurized to show you what the air leaks would look like. And they are those dark areas around the rim. So in this case, there's a weather stripping issue but with uncontrolled air leakage, you could get reductions of 10% or more. So 10% um, would be fairly modest. So the air leakage testing is necessary to tell you where and how much. You would uh, air seal gaps, cracks and openings, weather strip the doors and windows as necessary, and then uh, do some testing at the, at the end, obviously to find out uh, where you landed. And the added benefits would be improved comfort, humidity, con humidity control, and health and safety. If you have, for example, a, an attached garage or some other space where there might be some kind of hazardous materials or poor air quality associated with it, you don't wanna be drawing any of that into the house, in other words. So also any equipment producing heat or cold associated with your house has lots of energy use, therefore lots of opportunity for savings. For example, as we mentioned earlier, if you have an air conditioner, upgrade it to an air source heat pump. If you have a water heater, think about upgrading it to a heat pump water heater. Gas furnaces or boilers, I would recommend for the time being, if you have an older one, if you can get away with maintenance only, that would be the way to go. Avoid lock-in, and by lock-in, I mean avoid upgrading to a piece of equipment that is going to be obsolete in a few years' time. If we're all getting off of natural gas, you don't want to now invest $10,000 in, in the, the best boiler you can buy. Refrigerators and freezers, upgrade them. Uh, if they're more than 10 years old, they're, well, let's say 15 years old, they're probably pretty inefficient. Heat recovery from exhaust air, we mentioned this already to some extent. So you're gonna recapture about 75%. Uh, just, to, just wanna talk about uh, the difference between heat recovery ventilators and ERVs or energy recovery ventilators. 
in both cases, you're going to get the fresh air preheated for free. In other words, you're not you're not actively heating that air. You're just exchanging the heat from one airstream to another. And uh, but with the ERV, you're going to be able to preheat that air, and you're also going to have humidity regulation. And what I mean by that is that it will tend to maintain the same humidity level on either side of the HRV. If you have humid air outside, that humid air will tend to stay outside. It, the, the air going out will pick up humidity and go outside, and the air coming in will drop its humidity as it comes through the heat exchanger. These systems have low electrical consumption, but they do need regular cleaning maintenance. They need to be have some fairly modest servicing about four times a year. The filters need to be vacuumed and washed and the heat exchanger typically needs to be cleaned about once a year. Heat recovery from drain water. So uh, you can have a, your DWHR or drain water heat recovery. It's a, basically a hot water energy booster. We talked about these a little bit earlier. You're going to be getting up to 60% of the energy from your drain water, which would be mainly showers. They have no moving parts and no maintenance associated with them. The water coming into your water heater is preheated for free and they're installed by a plumber. So it's a very basic kind of installation. It obviously needs to be done correctly. This uh, illustration on the left is the one that is used for optimal efficiency. That in the, the preheated water goes both into the tank and it also goes into the cold water that's being supplied to your shower. So it preheats the cold water. So you, you kind of, um, you got two uses out of that incoming water immediately. So deeper energy efficiency upgrades. We have, um, there will be more details in part two, but uh, in brief, if you have empty wall cavities, you can fill them with cellulose to save up to 20% on heating. If you have exterior, uh, you can also use exterior wall insulation. Let's say you can't fill the cavities for some reason. It could be um, a masonry construction. Then you can insulate on the outside. Now it could also save you about 20%, but it will be potentially um, a lot more expensive, but certainly more expensive than filling cavities with uh, cellulose. So to give you an idea of what the cost would be here, uh, cellulose typically um, it would be maybe about $3,000 to fill all the walls in a house with cellulose. And that, uh, in, that includes drilling the holes, filling the cavities and patching the holes afterwards. Um, but the board insulation on the outside, uh, we're looking at, you know, uh, kind of in the, in the five figures. Now, if you were already installing, um, if you are already installing siding, then it would be less expensive because uh, you would uh, it would just be an, an incremental cost in that case, just uh, basically the cost of the uh, the materials cost of the insulation by and large. On the foundation front, you could have quite high savings for interior or exterior installation. It can be cost effective, but it requires expert advice for windows. Upgrading is usually necessary to reach net zero because uh, by the time you've made all your other improvements to the house, uh, you will also need to, to improve those windows to, to reach the, to get, get rid of those final gigajoules to, uh, to match your electrical consumption. Solar energy has big capital costs, but high returns. Um, and, uh, and the net metering will offset your entire annual electricity usage. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to talk about more in part two. And uh, you will obviously need a site assessment for the solar energy. Just going through some of the green certifications here, just another, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, now this uh, comparison is from the, the FCM study. They're showing the environmental performance of various systems. It comes out more or less the same as our, we had that chart that kind of looked like a speedometer. 
as you can see, net zero ends up being the highest in energy performance, and it's doing pretty well on the environmental performance. And as you work your way down, Passive House is there. Um, there are various other systems. We get to R2000, and then we get to Energy Star. So uh, it's uh, another way of comparing them uh, uh, on a basis of both environmental and energy performance. So uh, Natural Resources Canada, Energy Star is currently in transition Ontario, but within the next year, the following will apply. They're switching software um, and they're gonna be using the new ERS, which uses the gigajoule rating. Currently in Ontario, we're still on the zero to 100 scale. The energy consumption will be 20% better than code than as, as mentioned earlier, that's uh, kind of where they've been for a while. Uh, and code is a moving target. So, the, um, so this is uh, co constantly in transition. There are also performance or prescriptive streams um, for that, uh, you know, that system. And uh, the construction minimums are based on effective, not nominal R. Now, bear in mind that this is almost exclusively used for new construction, as is um, R2000, the following one. So, uh, and then if you look at the air leakage targets, it uh, is 2.5 for detached houses. And the equipment shall comply with Canada's energy efficiency regulations, but there were quite a few that were rated in Ontario last year, um, over 8,000. This is R2000. So it, uh, it is a, 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 a quite an old uh, system, but it was, and it was last updated in 2012. It still continues to use zero to 100 scale. Um, but it's a higher uh, target actually, 50%. It's only performance, construction, uh, there's various requirements for construction. The air leakage target is more aggressive. It's 1.5, which will be the same as what is being used for net zero uh, detached houses. The, uh, there are minimums for uh, HVAC there and your HRV has to be balanced. Extensive builder and advisor training is necessary. There were only three rated in Ontario in 2018 and seven in 2017. So it's uh, fairly minor in this part of the country as a rating system, but it's only for new housing. On the other hand, passive house uh, can be applied to existing housing. Um, basically, it's there are very low energy use buildings, not necessarily incorporating solar. There's uh, the Enerfit standard, which is maybe more suitable for older buildings that can't be ret retrofitted to the passive house standard. So they're, they've done something similar to what the CHBA is trying to do now with their new uh, uh, rating, a separate rating for existing housings, existing, existing housing. And PHI is suitable for buildings which don't fully comply with passive house criteria. So I'm not an expert in this field. There are others who are experts out there, or you can check out the Passive House Canada website to learn more about it. Also the Canadian Green Building Council for larger buildings. So these will be your large MERBs. Uh, they have now the zero carbon building standard, which uh, in which the performance stream also applies to retrofits. And there's a starting uh, fee at which they have, um, is, which is 1500 bucks as their base fee. Um, so that this is worth checking out if you have a building that's, uh, that doesn't fall into part nine uh, building code. And, uh, and you wanna retrofit it, let's say to, uh, to net zero or zero carbon. So in summary, the benefits of net zero, uh, are better homes. They, you have uh, better comfort. They're more constant, less, less drafty. Um, the costs uh, of operating and maintenance are, should be lower. Resilience, they're less affected by weather and better air quality on the, for improved health. You, for your own business as a renovator builder, uh, it enhances your business reputation to work on projects like this you're gonna have better buyer uh, happiness, better buyer satisfaction and uh, employee retention. And, um, 
and obviously you're going to have enhanced operational knowledge and planning skills associated with these kinds of projects. And these are all contributing to making uh, a, a better big picture for our city uh, on action on climate, on public health, resilience, and green economy. The dollars are staying in town, so it's all local business associated with this kind of activity. So uh, that's, uh, that ends uh, our presentation. I have one video that I'd like to share with you. In uh, Nova Scotia, they are promoting uh, these, uh, Efficiency Nova Scotia is promoting some, some uh, activity. And, um, and this is a video associated with this. Uh, Greg, we can we can't really see the video and we can't really hear it either. Oh, oh sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, I'm uh, the system seems to be overloaded here and uh, can't quite get the video here. I'm going to go back a little bit and see if we can uh, get the video going again. We're going to restart. Sorry about that. No, we can't see it or hear it. Sorry, Vita, what was that? Uh, we can't see the video or hear it. You can't see it or hear it. And I've no. got it. Okay. Uh, okay. That would be not great. Let me just see here. I can probably, um, I can probably grab it and share okay. my do you want to do you want to try that? That's the link is in that slide. Can you do you yeah, want to pull I'll up? Find it. I'll find it now. Okay, I can uh, just go back to the slide if you want. Oh, that's okay. I can grab it from your slides here. That I have. Sorry, guys. Just a sec. Let's just download this. Okay. What's the number of the slide? Oh, I can find it here. It's at the end. Okay, got it. It's 65. Yeah, got it. Okay. So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, hang on a sec. Do I, need to, do I need to unshare here? I think I can just take over, actually. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just a sec. Many. Okay. Sure. Sorry about this. Okay. Existing Canadian homes can be upgraded to achieve net zero energy, and all homes can benefit from improving their energy performance. Begin by evaluating the energy use of your home and developing an upgrade plan. A certified energy advisor can assist you with this step. Ensure that any structural concerns or water infiltration issues are resolved early in the upgrade process. Homeowners can make an effort to reduce their use of fuels that cannot be provided or offset by renewable resources. This may include all fossil fuels and any non-renewable sources of firewood and wood pellets. Install any upgrades that have a good return on investment. This often includes insulation to poorly insulated areas such as walls, ceilings and basements. Upgrades to improve air tightness should also be considered. Once the air tightness has improved, you must also ensure that ventilation is adequate. Replace all combustion appliances. Full electrification of the home is required in order to offset household energy usage with renewable energy sources. Heat pumps should be used for heating and cooling. They are currently the most efficient way to condition the air inside your home. 
Domestic hot water systems can be upgraded with drain water heat recovery systems or heat pump hot water tanks. Taken on their own, major improvements to the exterior of the home, such as new windows and exterior insulation, often have a poor return on investment. It is recommended that these upgrades be paired with deferred maintenance. For example, when siding on the home requires replacement, then adding exterior insulation at that time has a relatively small incremental cost and a more attractive return on investment. Solar photovoltaics are currently the best way to provide on-site renewable energy for your home wherever there is good solar exposure. Performance of your solar array can be maximized by ensuring that panels have the proper orientation and that shading has been minimized as much as possible. Following the correct order of operations can reduce the total cost of achieving net zero energy by limiting the required size of heating and renewable energy systems. Talk to your energy advisor about planning upgrades for your home. Sorry. Okay. So I just wanted to say uh, that that video, uh, even though we had nothing to do with making that video, it actually covers almost all the points that I was discussing. Um, uh, and so it's reassuring to me, at least, to see that um, you know we're on this we're on the same track for um, you know doing these kinds of retrofits. Um, because uh, all the same elements were there, the, um, the heat pumps, the, uh, the cost effective upgrades, and combining um, the deep retrofits with other kinds of upgrades and so on. Um, anyway, uh, you might wanna have another look at that video because it's, uh, it's an excellently put together uh, little, little piece uh, that kind of uh, shows you the practical aspects of, of doing this kind of retrofitting. So, um, Vita, there's, there was just the one last slide, which was actually just showing what we're going to be doing in the next presentation. Suffice it to say that we're going to be um, exploring the deeper retrofits in more detail. We're also going to be looking at um, three examples of uh, existing uh, homes.